Hello, and welcome to Canada Reads American Style. I'm Shauna. And I'm Rebecca. And as a geography graduate from a million years ago, I am beyond thrilled to introduce our very special guest, Adam Schultz, who is an explorer in residence at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and a best-selling author of Alone Against the North, A History of Canada in 10 Maps, and his most recent bestseller, Beyond the Trees, A Journey Alone Across Canada's Arctic. Welcome, Adam. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, I have to say that as a child, I became a geography, crazy, crazy geography nut, uh, maps and everything, because I grew up as a kid reading about explorers. So the opportunity for us to talk to you, a real live explorer in modern day is just kind of blows my mind. And I'm so thrilled to have you here today. So my first question for you, though, is what traits do explorers have that the average person does not? in what makes you different from the rest of us? <laughs> I like to think I'm not that different and that we're all explorers at heart, that uh, everyone, at least to a certain extent, maybe not to the same degree, but everyone has at least a little bit of an explorer inside of them. Because I think there's something in uh, you know human nature that we're fascinated about the world in which we live. And that that's something that's been reflected in um, human history since the very dawn of time when our first uh our, our earliest ancestors you know set off across the savannah uh to find new horizons so i like to think that it's not something that's unique that we all have it inside of us i guess my position is a little bit different in that i'm literally a professional explorer i'm one of the very lucky few um who can say that that is that their actual job title is an explorer I, i'm an explorer with the royal canadian geographical society as you said and maybe that's just reflects the fact that I maybe had that that capacity to a, a bit uh, greater degree than, than most other people, because basically that's what drives me out in the wilderness. It's this um, longing to know uh, more about what's beyond the river bend or, you know, in the deepest depths of the forest or on the other side of the hill or beyond the mountain. And that's something I just love uh, doing. I mean, I have a forest. I'm very lucky. I get to live in the forest on my and I go out there pretty much every day. It doesn't matter if you've been out there 10,000 times, you're still going to find something new. That's the great thing about uh, the natural world is um, there's always more to explore, whether it's a, you know, a new type of fungi or a bird call you haven't heard before or something you know, beneath the surface of the water. Um, nature is always, is always changing and there's always more to see. So I think it's that, it's that sense of curiosity about our world that makes you an explorer. And I like to think that Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's dormant, it's asleep in some, inside of some people, but I think it's still there on some level in almost everyone. And uh, that's just what I do. I try to, you know, answer that call. Well, you know, it's interesting because Americans are really poor at geography. We're really, we don't know. And I don't know that a lot of people have exploration necessarily. Maybe it's buried really deeply. So I wonder, are Canadians better at geography? And I'm sure you've heard the appalling stories about Americans who don't know basic, like where the states are, et cetera. So are Canadians better at geography than Americans? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not, I haven't seen any official statistics, but I have heard the stories about, you know, uh, when they do polls, people are really bad at identifying like North America on a map or what countries border the U.S. I, I, it could partly be, I mean, maybe it has to do with the school system, but it could also just be that, you know, the United States is kind of this uh, massive cultural juggernaut. You're, um, you know, one of the biggest and most powerful countries in the world. So I think if you're a citizen of that, uh, there's less need to know about the world beyond your borders the way that if you're from a small country, I mean, obviously geographically, Geographically, Canada is very large, but in terms of population, we're small. So, so much of our, it's kind of a reverse situation here. I'm on an American podcast, but normally, you know, so much of the media we would consume on a daily basis comes from outside of our borders, the movies, the TV shows, even the uh, magazines and music comes from outside of our borders. A lot of it comes from the United States or elsewhere. So maybe just because of that simple practical reason, uh, people from other countries are more aware of sort of where they are in the world because they're consuming pop culture from beyond their borders. And maybe in the United States, you have less of that. So maybe that partly explains. I'm just theorizing <laughs> here. I can't say for sure, but maybe that partly explains why Americans as a, as 
as a group know less about world geography. Um, I mean, that's possibly it, but I, I don't know. I could just be a uh, school system, but I think I've heard similar statistics that the average Canadian is not very good at geography either. Um, I briefly taught in university when I was doing my PhD. And for some of our early history courses, we would have a map on the exam and the students would have to label uh, the map because we always said that you couldn't really understand history unless you understood geography. And sometimes the students would protest and be like, no, it's too hard. You can't put a map on the exam. And they didn't want maps. But I never could really fathom that because I thought the map was kind of a gimme. Like, you know, it's 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 fascinating and it's not that hard. Just study the map and you'll it'll start to make sense. Right. So, yeah, it could be, could be we're not much better at geography. Yeah. Okay. I, and I agree. I mean, to me, I, everything I read, I read, if it's nonfiction I, or even fiction, I read it along looking at maps to get a context of where, uh, what, where the story is coming from, et cetera. So no, I'm totally a map person. So now here's a question though, that I really, I, every time I think about mosquitoes and black flies and what you experience on that, I want to know, is there anything you dread about exploring? Anything that I dread? uh coming home would that count <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i uh that's my my favorite thing is being outside in the wild uh you know i i get so excited just planning my next expedition and looking forward to it i'm always planning more expeditions than i ever could possibly do i'd have to live 10 lifetimes to even scratch the surface of all the ideas i come up with for projects and expeditions and uh, really i mean i love every moment of it i mean even the black flies are bad um, I sort of soak it all in and I, I really um, cherish the experience. If there's anything I dread, uh, to come back to that word you used, um, it might be, it's it's impossible to do what I do and not be aware of the fact that the natural world is uh, basically vanishing. Uh, we're losing more and more wilderness every year. You know, every year, um, more and more natural places disappear because of human development pressure. Uh, we're a fast growing world and there's just an insatiable demand for natural resources. So that's something I'm very conscious of. Uh, you know, we learned it in school as kids and then I see it with my own eyes. Places that 10 years ago were very remote and wild and untouched. Today might be, there, there might be like a huge diamond mine there or logging frontiers have been expanded. So that's the only thing I really dread is that those truly remote, wild, untouched places that I love are becoming um, harder and harder to find and eventually might disappear entirely. So that's that's actually what I, my heart more than anything else. In Beyond the Trees, when you mentioned that place where somebody rich had flown all that stuff in to build that compound, it was, it actually kind of took my breath away because I was in the wild with you just reading that book and really absorbed. And then when you said that thing was there, I, I just thought, oh my gosh, like it's, someday i mean it, it it shouldn't even be there right because it's it's in the middle of wilderness and somebody had enough money to be able to craft something you know for themselves because they were wealthy enough to be able to afford to do it yeah it was definitely a bizarre sight after uh, weeks of just canoeing alone across the arctic tundra and seeing nothing but natural features like rocks and lakes and lichens and grasses and then all of a sudden coming across this compound um, it looked like something out of a science fiction movie because it was in the middle of nowhere, but it was a pretty extensive compound of different uh, buildings made out of modern materials like metal. And, um, it, and it was like, yeah, that doesn't really fit the landscape, but it's an acknowledgement that that sort of thing is probably only going to become more common as the years go by and uh, more and more lakes get uh, lodges built on them or other facilities get built on them. And um, I know some people may be listening think, well, why is that a bad thing, right? They're just making it more accessible or they're developing it or maybe they're making, uh, you know, some sort of economic windfall from this. And I just think, you know, there's something special about a place where you're still seeing sort of wild, untouched nature. And when you've experienced it, you can sort of start to appreciate almost the magic and the, the beauty to that place. So it's those kind of places that are becoming rare in our world. And I definitely think that there's good reason to make sure that we set aside and preserve uh, wild places and wilderness so that it will always be there, hopefully. Yeah. Now, when you're out on your explorations, 
uh, how does your, I want to know, how does your family view that? Because especially when you're on solo adventures, I can't even imagine what that must be for your family. And, and are you able to be in touch with them? I know you had a satellite phone uh, in Beyond the Trees, but that it was very expensive, obviously, to use. But I'm just wondering, is there is there some form of communication that your family has with you when you're out there alone? Well, as you said, uh, the only way you could communicate uh, would be through a satellite phone because uh, otherwise ordinary phones wouldn't work. I mean, where I am is very remote. So the nearest cell tower would be like over a thousand kilometers away or more. <laughs> more. Um, so no, no ordinary cell phone would work and you would have to, the only way you could communicate would be through a satellite orbiting the earth. And there are satellite phones, which look sort of like an old fashioned walkie talkie with an antenna on them, but they're not foolproof. Uh, they're actually pretty difficult in my experience, at least the ordinary ones that I rent when I'm using one. Uh, they're pretty difficult to get to work a lot of the time. You know, the call will drop or cut out. And as I uh, said in my book, they're expensive to use uh, because the minutes cost extra. So for the most part, I'm doing things the old fashioned way, which is when I set off into the wilderness with my backpack and my canoe, I'm not in touch or in communication with anyone, I'm just out in the wild, uh, which I actually like. I mean, I think that that actually makes it less stressful, at least for me. I don't want to have any distractions. I don't want to be worried about things back in civilization. I just kind of want to lose myself uh, in what I'm doing, the journey, and focus on the task at hand. So that's generally the way I do things. Um, at the time I wrote Beyond the Trees, I wasn't married, but I'm married now. And my wife is actually very supportive of my expeditions. She sometimes encourages me to go longer, um, you know, push myself farther. She's like, what? Only three months? Why not four? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but she she doesn't have a problem with that. But I mean, she knew who I was uh, when we when we met. So uh, I guess she kind of uh, you know she she knew what I was like, and I think that um, I mean she's very supportive of it. So that's a good thing for me, definitely. Oh, that's awesome! No, I'm really happy to hear that because I, that's all I kept thinking is I can't imagine like if I were if I had someone out there in my family out there, I would be going crazy, not knowing what's going on. But I'm, but I think that's true. When she knows who you are, she married you, she's, you know, she's supportive. So that's, that, that's fantastic to hear that. So uh, now I do have a quote from um, Alone Against the North. You described an area around the Aquatuck River and you said, as I moved through the woods, it was with a vague feeling of uneasiness as if I shouldn't disturb this primeval place. And I just wondered if that is often how you feel or was it just kind of a one time that you felt that way? I thought that was really fascinating. Well, I do sometimes feel like that. That's one of the things I love the most about the wilderness. Um, in Northern Canada, where I do a lot of my expeditions in the subarctic, so the area just immediately south of the Arctic, um, there's an incredible diversity of landscape. And I think a lot of people, they don't realize that. They just sort of assume that when we're talking about the Canadian wilderness, it must all be pretty much the same, like just some stereotypical image in their mind, and it doesn't vary much. But in reality, that's not true at all, especially when you come to know the natural world and you know, like the forest and all the different trees and plants. Um, different lakes have a totally different feel to them, at least I think so, and different areas of the forest uh, can feel very differently. And partly, you know, it's influenced by the weather, like if it's a gray day and it's uh, storm clouds, uh, that patch of forest might start to feel a little more um, foreboding and a little more eerie. But other places uh, feel like carefree and it's like this is like something out of a fairy tale. And definitely I've been lucky enough that I've experienced different places on my journey um, that really have a powerful uh, feel to them. And the one that you're alluding to in, in Alone Against the North there, that place was one of the most um, pristine, untouched places I've ever been to. Like, you know, not at all like if you go to a, a national park or something and you find a pop can or a well-marked trail with signage up everywhere. We're talking about a place that was old growth forest uh, in the subarctic. So you're talking about trees that are up to 400 years old, black spruce, but they're very small, about the size of your wrist. Uh, because the conditions are so harsh that the growing season is very, very slow. And it takes centuries for a tree just to grow to like what would be a sapling in Michigan. And, uh, you know, just a world of moss, moss cloaks and covers everything from the branches of the trees to the floor or the, the ground beneath your feet. And it had this, it had this sort of um, ancient untouched feel to it, like something out of a legend or a fairy tale. And I felt like, you know, 
I have to tread very lightly here. I barely want to put my foot down uh, lest I step on a wild flower or some mushroom and disturb this place because it just seems so perfect. And I didn't really want to disturb it in any way. So I try to tread as lightly as I can uh, whenever I'm in these places. Like my motto has always been, um, you know, take only memories, leave only footprints. And sometimes I don't even want to leave the footprint. So I'm, I'm almost tiptoeing around uh, some of these special places. Well, and I think that's what I learned because I I don't know. I didn't really know specifically what northern that part, part of northern Canada would look like. And it's interesting because through your book and all the descriptions that you gave of the landscape, that was so helpful to me. And then I started looking at photographs. I started looking on Instagram and, and looking at different places so that I could get a better sense of it too, visually from rather than just from the book. But yeah, that was really a, kind of surprising to me because that's not kind of what I expected. Now, in saying all of that, I wonder then, do you have a preferred landscape? Like if you, if they told you, you could only go to one landscape to explore, do you have like a preferred one? And season wise, would it be like winter or what What would that be? Well, that that's a hard choice because I love uh, all the different Canadian landscapes. So definitely I would say within Canada, I don't have as much desire to explore uh, other environments around the world like deserts or jungles, but I love all the different areas of Canada's uh, wilderness. And Canada is pretty diverse. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that, but we have you know, everything from temperate rainforest to northern deserts that look like the Sahara, nothing but miles and miles of sand and sand dunes, um, to boreal forest, which is mostly coniferous trees, black spruce, tamarack, uh, to we have a forest in southern Ontario that's actually called Carolinian forest because it's not that different than what you would see in North Carolina uh, with broadleaf trees like sassafras. Um, so I love all those different Canadian landscapes. Uh, if I only could, if I had to pick just one, uh, my favorite, as I sort of alluded to in the previous question, is the subarctic. That's my favorite place to be. Uh, I love the Arctic too. I mean, wandering around the Arctic tundra in the summer is a lot of fun. <laughs> Not so much in the winter, but in the summer, I like the Arctic tundra. But that boreal forest is the landscape where I feel most at home. I use a, a, an expression that it feels like home ice to me. <laughs> to use a hockey <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. Um, that's that's where I feel most. I just love the moss and the lichens, the wild mushrooms, the plants, uh, the trees. There's something about the trees that grow there. You have birch and cedar and uh, black spruce, white spruce, tamarack. Has a really familiar feel to me. Even the scent, like the uh, the smell of the forest, uh, makes me feel at home. And I love that landscape probably the most of all. So that's the landscape I deal with in Alone Against the North, um, and that's that's my favorite landscape probably. If I had to choose one but i like the i like the diversity and i also think you know similar to michigan i i like the four seasons i i wouldn't want to live in a, a place that only had one season or just two seasons i really like like the change um that we get with all four seasons so that's that's partly what makes it special yeah. too now this might be an inappropriate question but i just felt i had to ask it in terms of reading about your again i keep thinking my gosh you were out there as a solo explorer so i'm going to ask this question i hope this is a, it's okay but um the opening quote in chapter 11 of alone against the north it says fearless quote fearlessness is better than a faint heart for any man who puts his nose out of doors the length of my life and the day of my death were faded long ago and I wondered as a solo explorer, do you fear death or do you think it's faded? Does it not worry you to be out there alone? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I like that quote to be, I mean, to be sure those aren't my words. That's uh, from the Vikings over a thousand years ago, one of the Norse sagas uh, translated there. And I like to start each chapter in my book with a quote from something I enjoy. And I, I was partly putting that quote into the, the book there just to sort of comment on the, the irony of how much we've changed, uh, how we live in such a risk adverse society nowadays. I think, you know, it's very risk adverse uh, where we won't do anything without like, uh, you know, a lot of canoeists won't go canoeing without a helmet <laughs> and a life jacket <laughs> and everything else, you know, their emergency beacons. And, you know, you think these earlier um, times, they took incredible risks uh, sailing the open ocean without modern GPS or charts or life jackets or any of this stuff. So I sometimes, you know, I partly invoke that because some people will say that, oh, you're such a risk taker. Or you take such risks. And I'm like, no, not really. Not by any historical standard. 
Uh, these people were doing far more dangerous things than anything I do. Um, I mean, certainly I'm not, I'm not a, but I'm not some sort of a daredevil. I mean, I'm not trying to tempt fate. I'm not evil can evil. I, I go into the wilderness because I actually enjoy it and I find it relaxing and peaceful. Uh, not because I think like I'm taking my life in my hands or something like that. Uh, you know, partly when I was doing those expeditions, uh, in Alone Against the North, I mean, some of those expeditions with the book, the book starts in 2008. So I was describing expeditions 13 years ago. Uh, I'm 35 now. So I was 22 at that time. And I think partly just as any explorer, adventurer, uh, when you're in your earlier 20s, you're probably a little bit more of a risk taker or daredevil than you are as you get a bit older. So I was maybe a bit more um, of a of a risk taker at that time when I was canoeing like big white water and stuff. But even then, I was always trying to be smart and err on the side of caution. Uh, the other part of your question, if I think like, you know, things are faded and you can't control it. No, not really. I do think you're kind of in control of your own life. And, you know, if you were smart, you make the right decisions. You can avoid bad situations in the wild. Um, but I, I do kind of like that that mindset that they had um, where, you know, you just have to sort of seize the day and live life to the fullest. Um, because it, it's brief and we're only here for a blink of an eye. So you better make the most of it, which I do agree with that part of the sentiment. Well, I, I do want to say too, that in reading your book, when I first started to read it, I, I just thought, oh my gosh, this is incredibly crazy. I, I, what is this man thinking? But as you go through both books, what I walked away with is you are, First of all, you're more knowledgeable than probably anybody I've ever met in my entire life about all of what you were doing. Plus, you're taking calculated risks, but you weren't. I agree. You're not a daredevil. You're not out there because I read a lot of books about like mountain climbers and some of those people that do solo climbs that are crazy. And I just think what is in their head? But reading your book, I sort of felt like, no, it, you you're a student of your craft. So it's all calculated risk, right? So you're not out there just being kind of crazy and, and tempting fate or anything like that. So I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. Because, yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't want people, if, if they haven't quite read the book yet, I don't want them to think, Oh, you're going to read this freewheeling crazy person because sometimes I have read books like that, but no, you, like I said, you're a student of your craft. Absolutely. Yeah, I've had, uh, I mean, I've had different people approach me over the years to want to join my expeditions and I have taken some of them on for different ex expeditions I've, I've done, but I always say I kind of, I kind of uh, stray away from the adrenaline junkies because those people make me nervous. Uh, I like to do things, you know, uh, very methodically on an expedition, which is, you know, if we're going to run those rapids or we're going to cross this big Arctic lake, uh, we're going to really analyze it and think out a strategy and go about it um, as carefully as possible because it's like a calculated risk that we can't avoid. If we, you know, there's no way to avoid it, but we're going to do it as carefully as possible. So that is my approach. I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Now, I this I have to say that when I was reading again, um, Alone Against the North, this actually made me laugh out loud. And I even shared it with my mom because it made me laugh. But in the book, you say that once or twice you got caught in, quote, terrifying waves far from shore. And first of all, I thought, seriously, all those things you've done and that's the most terrifying is this, you know, is, is that moment that you actually, you know, termed terrifying. So then I thought, is that the most terrified you've been on a solo expedition? Yes, absolutely. That is by far the most white knuckle stuff I've ever done is just wow. I know in it. But is statistically, if you look at people who die in the wilderness, it's not bear attacks or anything sensational. It's you're most likely to just drown. And if you're in a little canoe, um, it doesn't take a whole lot in terms of waves and wind to flip that canoe. No matter how skilled a canoeist you are, there's only so much you could do. If the waves get big, you're going to flip your canoe. And when you're in northern Canada, the water temperature, even in the middle of summer, is very cold. So it doesn't take very long in it before you're going to um, die of hypothermia. So on my expedition, sometimes it's a matter of necessity. I mean, as I just said, I don't go out there deliberately trying to do risky things, but sometimes if you're going to canoe 4,000 kilometers alone across the Arctic, you don't have much of a choice. Uh, so you do have to be pretty far from land. And I've been out in a canoe, like, you know, miles offshore. Um, I'm thinking in kilometers because I'm Canadian, but like five kilometers from land. So it's like three miles. Uh, and if, if the wind picks up out there, you're in a very dangerous situation. So by far, if I were to come up with a list of like the 10 scariest moments in my life, 
probably six or seven of them would be terrifying waves when the waves get big and I'm just battling for every inch. And it's stressful because you, you mean, you could, you could uh, angle your canoe into the big wave or a hundred times correctly, but it wouldn't matter because all it takes is one wave uh, just to spell disaster. So you have to get each wave right. And you have thousands of waves to get through before you get back to land. So those are definitely my most stressful moments um, because if you did get into the water really far offshore, uh, your odds, the odds are not good <laughs> um, because, you know, your body is just going to start to shut down. You're going to lose feeling in your, your, your extremities first, and then that's going to go up your arms and then eventually all the way to your core. Uh, and whether or not you can get back to land before hypothermia gets you is an open question. Uh, so those are definitely the scariest moments. The ones that I least uh, like experiencing is anytime <laughs> I have to battle wind and waves. I will definitely share that with my mom because we were both kind of having a laugh over that. Cause I had been telling her about the book, all the books all along. And I just said, I thought that was, you know, grizzly bears, polar bears, doesn't matter. It's the terrifying waves, which I thought was really funny. So now I, I have to say that this was probably my favorite quote in the book. And I know it's, it seems like a really simple little, um, quote, but it just really touched my heart because you said in uh, Beyond the Trees, you said staring at maps is, quote, a dangerous thing. And I thought, um, first of all, how often are you staring at maps? And what comes first? Is it you stare at a map to determine where you want to go? Or do you decide where you want to go? And then you spend a lot of time staring at maps, which I think is a beautiful thing. Yes, I was being a little bit uh, humorous there, but I think it's also partly true that staring at maps can be a dangerous thing, at least in my line of work, because that's usually how I dream up these uh, journeys, these expeditions. I look, look at a map, like, you know, a map on the wall can be bewitching. I just start staring at it and soon I'm under the spell of the map and dreaming up possibilities, literally just taking my finger on the map and going from point A to point B and saying, you know, is that possible? Is there a way I could make that work? And that's usually how it begins any of my expeditions. It starts with a big map and I go from there. So sometimes I just look at the map and say, you know, could I get from Hudson Bay to the Bering Sea? And I don't know if it's possible, but you got to start somewhere. And it usually starts with a dream. And uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes the sometimes the dream is uh, beyond our reach. And that's kind of what I met with. Well, it can be a dangerous thing if you if you stare at the map long enough and you dream up something that's going to be very difficult to actually pull off in reality. Uh, that that can be that can be a little bit uh, hazardous. But I try to I try to come down on the side of uh, what's possible and uh, maintain that. Yeah. Now, you mentioned and I was happy to, to read this part of the book as well, again, in uh, Beyond the Trees. You mentioned that as part of your academic research, you studied bear attacks. And I wondered if that's why you seem a bit unconcerned about bears, even though you've had a few scary incidents. Because before I read that part, I kept thinking, I can't believe you're out in bear country, sometimes without bear spray, sometimes without the proper whatever you think you need. And then I read that part and I was like, okay, so you're pretty schooled on bears, right? <laughs> yeah, I think, well, I think partly it's just because I have a lot of experience with bears. I mean, um, there's so many bears in Canada, like Ontario alone has over 100,000 bears, both black bears and uh, bears in Northern Ontario, polar bears. So I just have, some, I have a lot of experience just walking around in the woods where there's bears around and you get to know bears. And eventually I think if you study bears or you, don't even really study them formally. You just spend a lot of time out there. Um, you start to be able to read their behavior and you realize bears are really smart. They're like smarter than even the smartest dog. Uh, and just like dogs, they have different personalities. Like some dogs are playful. Others are a little more tense and standoffish. You can start to read the bear's behavior. Uh, just like some people can read horses. And then you realize like, well, you know, most of the bears, they're not really, they're not really a threat. They don't really want any trouble. And most of the time they're more afraid of us than we are of them. And you can usually frighten them off pretty easily uh, just by making noise. So like where I live in Northern Ontario, um, I, used to, I just used to like go out every day of the week walking in the woods around my house with just a little walking stick. And it wasn't uncommon that I'd cross paths with a like, black bear or something. And almost all the time I would just make a, a noise and, or didn't, sometimes I just stare there and look at the bear and it wouldn't cause any trouble, which makes sense. Like, and I guess that's the academic side of things. Like statistically, the odds of a bear actually attacking you are very low. And I think partly it's just 
we tend to fear what we're not familiar with. So if you're used to walking around with bears around you, eventually, even though it's not like they can't kill you, I mean, they are powerful and if they choose to kill you, they probably could, but the odds of that happening are so low that eventually you just, you kind of become numb to it because you're familiar with them and you don't really think about it. Same way that, you know, uh, people, people don't really fear what they're, what they're used to. They fear things like, you know, someone might be like, well, I would never go to Michigan. I could get mugged there. That's what a lot of Canadians <laughs> say about the U S right. A lot of Canadians have views that the U S is this crazy, dangerous place where someone might gun you down. Um, so we get nervous, like, oh, I'm, I'm worried about going to the U S or Michigan across the border, but I'm sure talking to you, you'd be like, that's kind of silly, right? Why would you think like that? But if you're not familiar <laughs> with it, you could let those irrational fears start to eat away at you. Uh, that's, so that's basically how I look at it. Yeah, that's probably true. But, but, but doesn't a grizzly or a polar bear have a different feel to than the bears you kind of grew up around in Northern Ontario? I mean, because you can't, like, you don't even... You, you do you did you feel fear when you saw when you see have seen grizzlies or a polar bear well it depends polar bears well it depends i mean i've come across polar bears that were really shy and ran away as soon as they saw me but others are like much more aggressive and i talked about having a polar bear come straight at me and growl at me and that's definitely scary right there's no no two ways about it it's scary when you have a thousand pound polar bear at the top of the food chain wow. coming straight at you Grizzlies have a reputation of being like very aggressive, but in my experience, which is mostly with bears in northern Canada, so those are like Arctic grizzlies. In my experience, they're actually timid. Um, I've had lots of grizzlies cross paths with them, and they almost always run away. Even a mother with cubs, she took one look at me and just ran, and her cubs were left behind. Um, so I think that you know, partly the grizzlies' reputation as being ferocious is a little bit of an exaggeration. I mean, again. There are different subspecies of bears, and I'm talking, so that might not not necessarily be universally applicable to bears on, say, the west coast of British Columbia or in Alaska or what have you. But uh, I still think, you know, the odds are relatively low that one would attack you, which is not to say they wouldn't attack you. I mean, I've studied thousands of bears, bear attacks, but there's usually like a pattern of behavior um, that you can see when bear attacks happen. Um, it's unusual that they happen randomly and again i'm not cavalier i have a very careful routine i follow every night when i'm alone in the wilderness in bear country uh things i do little tricks i've picked up over the years uh sort of minimize any encounters with bears and make sure they're aware of me and they're not going to cause trouble uh, and in in another irony though is that i have to say that of all the bears i've encountered black bears and polar bears and grizzly bears <laughs> black bears in many ways um even though they're the smallest of the bears, they can be in some ways the most meddlesome and the most troublesome. They're very intelligent. So they're the ones that are maybe the most inclined to actually come into your camp at night in the dark <laughs> and sniff around your tent and actually try to steal food from you just because black bears are very smart. And um, they're probably, of all the bears that have caused the most nuisance to me, uh, black bears are the ones that have most often come into my camp at night and woke me up in the middle of the night. The, Polar bears and the grizzlies don't do that as often. On the other hand, if they do come around, that's usually worse because unlike the black bears, they're not trying to steal like your granola bar. They're trying to eat you. So, uh, but yeah, most of the time, no, most of the time, all the bears of all the species um, don't really behave all that aggressively, but sometimes they do. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Cause that was really, I've always kind of laughed and said that, you know, I'm worried about a bear attack. Of course, I'm never going to probably go where there are bears. So I just always have this longstanding joke about, you know, bear attacks. But anyway, um, in the beyond... it all the time, I promise. <laughs> it, I mean, it is a real thing. I don't want, I don't want some of your listeners to think like, oh, he's some sort of like foolish, naive person who doesn't understand the danger. I mean, as you know, from my books, I give lots of examples of like graphic bear attacks <laughs> in all of the books. So it can't happen, but we don't want to oversell yeah. it or exaggerate the the uh, the odds of a bear attacking you. I guess a good analogy would be dog attacks. Like if you actually look up the statistics, a surprising number of people either end up in the hospital or even dead from dog attacks. But on a day to day basis, we don't really worry about some dog coming out and attacking us, even though it really does happen. Right? Like there are hundreds of dog attacks every year in the U.S. <laughs> Um, but it's not something we would fear on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, because we know most dogs aren't going to do that. And that's just sort of how I look at it with the bears. Um, the risk is there, but it's relatively small. 
Okay, so in Beyond the Trees, which is your journey across uh, Canada's Arctic uh, region, I was just curious, this was just simply my curiosity was what percentage of your of that trip do you think you walked versus canoed because you were portaging a lot? And so I was just curious if you had any idea of like percentage wise, what was on foot and what was on canoe? Uh, well, I did work that out at one point when I was writing the book, uh, which is four years ago to go now um i think it was so the, the vast majority of the distance was by water so canoeing but that's not necessarily the same thing as the vast majority of the time because of course walking or portaging takes vastly longer uh, because i had to make four loads with all of my different um backpacks and things uh so i think in terms of distance in terms of distance of my no, almost four thousand kilometer route on foot was probably around 500 kilometers oh. um so that's that's like one eighth right so the seventh eight eighth of the time i was in the water um in terms of distance but in terms of actual time that's not quite the case because portaging when i'm on foot takes vastly longer than paddling right uh i might spend an entire day portaging just three kilometers because i have to back track you know back and forth for each load right like go forward with the backpack on three kilometers set it down go back without my load to get the next load. So that's six kilometers, just doubling back. I uh, get the next load, carry it forward. So now we're at nine kilometers, set it down, go back. Now we're at 12 kilometers, get the, the second barrel, bring it back 15 kilometers, set it down, <laughs> go back 18 kilometers. And last but not least, grab my canoe, which weighs you know 55 pounds or so and drag that three kilometers. So we're talking 21 kilometers just to move three kilometers on the map when I'm traveling on foot. Um, so that could take a whole day Whereas the next day, if I'm on the water, I might paddle 100 kilometers and do that all in like 12 hours. So uh, that's why I would say, yeah, about 500 kilometers or so on foot. But time-wise, a much greater percentage of my journey, I'm moving around on foot. Okay, I love just knowing that. So that's actually kind of cool. Thanks for answering that. Or thanks for actually having an answer uh, for that. That's awesome. And then I was curious because you mentioned a few times, obviously, that you have that you journal and you're writing and drawing in your journal. And I was curious if you know how many journals you've written and if they will one day be in an archive for future generations. It's funny you should ask that. I have a massive stack of, of journals uh, from all the adventures and ed expeditions I've done um, going back to when I was a teenager. Uh, and the vast majority I've never written about or said anything about, I've only you know, only a few of my expeditions have I actually publicized. The rest are just locked away in my archive of, of journals and notes. Uh, I don't know what would happen to them after maybe I die. Like maybe maybe that someone will laugh and snicker because like, yep, this summer he gets eaten by a grizzly. He shouldn't have said that. Not, <laughs> knock on wood. Uh, and then maybe, yeah, maybe they'll get, maybe they'll get donated to the local uh university or the archive and somebody can dig through them probably my books would sell a lot better if i did get eaten that seems to be a thing yeah, so, yeah don't do that yeah, don't do that uh, for the time being <laughs> yeah for the time being those are just unpublished journals that i've kept from my different expeditions but when i do write books i use the journal um to form the basis of the book and i try to keep as detailed notes as possible in the field for that reason well it's interesting because i think when you were in Alone Against the North and you talked about the Again River and how you were trying to find any kind of documentation about this river, think about how important all of those journals are. And I just having, I, I when I was a student, a library student, I worked in the archives in Detroit. And I have to just say that being able to go back and look at different people's uh, written records and, and even things like receipts of things they purchased, all of those records you know, go together nicely in an archive. And I guarantee you all of what you have is so valuable. And often when you're alive, I don't know if you know this, but often when you're alive, people bid for your, for your uh, records. So I think that you should definitely um, think about where you would want them to go and think about future, especially you're documenting an area of the world that as you say is changing. And think how critically important all of what you have done since you were a teenager will be to future researchers. So I would just like to throw that out there as a librarian. Just want to say that. Uh, well, I always say, you know, li 
Libraries were my second favorite place growing up after the woods. If I wasn't in the woods, I was in the library exploring books. So I'll keep that in mind. I think I have to do a few more expeditions before uh, before they would want my journals. So I'll try to set the bar high and keep doing them <laughs> so that I get more journals from libraries. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Now, um, this and I don't even know if this is if you'd even have an answer for this one, but I'm curious if there's anything that scares you enough that you wouldn't attempt it anything that scares you enough that you would not attempt it well i mean yes definitely i can think i can think <laughs> of, <laughs> i can think of a lot of crazy things um i mean i wouldn't canoe i wouldn't canoe across an ocean uh that's for sure but i mean i know people have rough, yeah I, I mean i guess that that would be kind of impossible unless you're using like one of those highly modified boats that it's like complete this complete shell so you're inside and you're protected but there's definitely an upper limit to how far i'll canoe offshore um you know i wouldn't canoe across i don't think i would canoe across lake michigan or lake huron that's too far lake erie yes maybe i would do lake erie i have canoed into the heart of lake erie but i make sure that i've <laughs> studied the forecast very carefully uh when doing that sort of thing but there is definitely an upper limit to how far i would canoe from shore you know so you know living in michigan how 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 big the Great Lakes are and how stormy they could be. So there's definitely a limit to how far offshore, how far offshore I would go in a canoe. Yeah, and not only that, you've got freighters going across the Great Lakes a lot. So I'm assuming were you watching for, did you look at their routes and stuff when you were going across or in the heart of uh, Lake Erie? Were you looking at that? Uh, well, I didn't plan it ahead of time or have anything, but for the most part, we were pretty, I was with my friend Wes when we were doing that, it was in 2018, uh, in our canoe with the two of us, we, we were pretty good at maneuvering so we could see any big ships a long way off and make sure we weren't in the path <laughs> before they got down to us. Um, but yes, I mean, there's a, it, it all depends on the conditions, as you know, on the Great Lakes, it can go from uh, calm to stormy. And you definitely wouldn't want to be far from shore in a canoe when it gets stormy out there. So, yes, there's definitely things I would not attempt. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I have to say we've come to our final question. And I'm not even sure, again, if this one's one that you can or would want to answer. But in uh, Beyond the Trees, you mentioned hypothetical projects you would like to attempt one day. And I was wondering, could you share any of those with us? And then also, what lies ahead? Do you have any solo explorations planned? Or I think you are writing another book right now. Uh, yes, I am working on another book that's coming out in October. That's about a recent expedition I did in northern Canada in Labrador. It's actually, if you like mystery and suspense, uh, this is the book for you. Because I actually went to go investigate a supernatural legend of things that go bump in the night in this deep, dark corner of the Canadian wilderness. Um, a place that was supposed to be haunted by a kind of uh, monster legend from 100 years ago. And I sort of had some clues from the archives, old journals and letters. And I tried to piece it together and tell the story of facing this route. Um, so if you like spooky stuff and Halloween, this is definitely the book for you. It's coming out in October this year. Uh, maybe maybe after it comes out, you'll want to yes. have me back on the show. And we can discuss Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of expeditions, sounds good to me then. Uh, in terms of expeditions, I have, I think, three planned for this year. And I'm definitely doing a lot more uh, for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Everything under the sun from epic journeys to expeditions about um, looking for endangered species uh, to more archaeology based ones where we're looking for like the lost explorer and that kind of stuff. So I have a lot of that going on. People are curious about it. They can find me on Instagram or Facebook or just check out my website and I'll have updates on all those projects soon. Well, yeah, we absolutely will link to everything uh, in this podcast and I just want to say, Adam, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us today. This is a dream come true. I love authors, but I, somebody who's an explorer, as I said, as a kid, I loved explorers so much. And just to have a moment with a modern day explorer is just the highlight of my life right now as a geography and a ge geographer and as a librarian. I just have so enjoyed it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.